Welcome to the Your Lifestyle is Your Medicine podcast, where we do deep dives into topics of mind, body, and spirit. Through these conversations, you'll hear practical advice and effective strategies to improve your health and ultimately add health span to your lifespan. I'm Ed Paget. I'm an osteopath and exercise physiologist with a special interest in longevity. Today, we're talking to Dr. Tommy Wood. He's an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington, where he studies brain injury and how lifestyle choices and environmental factors contribute to brain health, cognitive function, and chronic disease. I thought he would be the perfect person to talk to about how we can tease out some of the research in cutting edge science to help stave off or prevent cognitive decline, aka dementia, as we age. Today, Tommy and I look at aspects of lifestyle medicine and what we can do with nutrition, exercise, sleep, and community to protect our brains as we age. In the next 50 minutes, Tommy tells us the essential nutrients our brains need to recover from injury. He tells us how much exercise we need and what we need to do to keep our brains from shrinking. He tells us why sleep is so important and how to improve it, and also how we are wired to be community animals and how being a lone wolf actually changes our body chemistry. Don't miss this one. It's a really special episode. So Tommy Wood, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, really excited to be here. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go through a lot of stuff in this hour, so we're gonna be we're gonna be super quick and super focused. But I know that you can talk about any one of these subjects we're gonna get into for hours and hours and hours. So I'm gonna maybe uh, ask you to sort of you know put your money where your mouth is and give us some <laughs> actionable steps on right. these aspects of lifestyle medicine. All right, so you're you're involved with lifestyle medicine uh, in the UK, is that correct? Yeah, uh, a few years ago, probably seven or eight years ago now, I was involved as a founding trustee. And I'm still a trustee and director of the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine, which is, I think, the, the fastest growing and maybe second largest uh, lifestyle medicine society in the world right now. Um, mm -hmm. And working really hard to support lifestyle medicine uh, around the world. So uh, building these communities of uh, lifestyle medicine societies within individual countries and helping other countries build their own lifestyle medicine societies as well as trying to build out some uh, educational processes so uh, doctors can get diplomas and things mm -hmm. like that and, and learn about lifestyle medicine so so yeah. yeah it's it's kind of it's an exciting time because that that's really a growing field right now it is and the reason that i'm interested in lifestyle medicine to help people basically add health span to their lifespan is that I see there's kind of two silos uh, in medicine. There's this more holistic approach, lifestyle medicine, everything's interconnected. And then I think, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but in the future, there's going to be more the nano medicine where it's very sort of precise. And the two are not mutually exclusive, but I feel as though um, for me anyway, I'm putting my sort of hat on the lifestyle medicine because I'm, I'm not trained and don't have the, the experience in the, the nano medicine. Is that is that correct or am I over, oversimplifying things? No, I think that's right. I wouldn't. I, I would say that nano medicine is probably um, sort of an over over specialization. I, I'd, okay. I'd maybe zoom out a little bit and say personalized medicine, yeah, uh, perhaps. So, so then we're talking about uh, individual treatments based on genetics or mm -hmm. a better understanding of somebody's individual biomarkers. Nano medicine could go into that. Um, so, uh, you know, a targeted therapy to get the the exact drug you want to only the, the part of the body you want uh, to get a specific response that decreases side effects and stuff like that. That's actually mm -hmm. something I do do a little bit of work in uh, as well. Um, or my wife does and I collaborate with right. her. She's the expert in, in nanomedicine. But there's, there's two broad schools of thought there. You're right. So lifestyle medicine right now says... What are things that we can do to, at the population level and the individual level, improve somebody's overall health and decrease their risk of chronic disease and or maybe even reverse um, or put into remission some chronic disease? Mm -hmm. And those, you know, I think those are the basics that we should provide to everyone. Um, and then that's not always going to do the trick. There's not not every disease is going to be fully pre prevented or, you know, there are some diseases that require a different approach. And that's where I think personalized medicine is then going to be going to come to the forefront. But we're really right at the beginning of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're kind of 
try and get your biggest bang for your buck in terms of population and, and individual health right now, I think lifestyle medicine really is uh, the, the place to focus. Yeah. Okay, good. We're in the, we're in the right place. Okay, so we've got the lifestyle medicine sort of tenants are nutrition, physical activity, sleep and recovery, avoiding toxic substances, stress management and community, right? So there's a, there's a high level overview. So I want to take those and I, and I would love to to pick your brain about what we can do to help stave off, um, you know, the, basically the big one is any sort of form of dementia. And how do we do that using each one of these principles? So the, the first one is nutrition. So what's the science saying to, to help the average person now, or maybe even if they have the first symptoms of dementia, what do they do with nutrition? I think that the simplest answer to that is to eat a nutrient dense, minimally processed diet. Mm -hmm. um and there are just so many ways to do that and by focusing on sort of the overall quality of food we might then be able to skip some of the arguments about keto versus plant-based versus mm -hmm. carnivore versus something else right because what i think most of those diets have in common is that compared to the standard british or american diet is they are much higher in nutrients and they have a, a far few, far less or, or maybe none um, ultra processed foods, mm -hmm. uh, both of which, you know, avoiding one and getting more of the other are, are critical for long term brain and overall health. So mm -hmm. that's where I would start. Um, if you're thinking about dementia, and usually when people are asking dementia, they're actually asking about Alzheimer's disease, which makes up about 80% of dementia on average, um, particularly late onset Alzheimer's disease. So there's not a, a specific genetic cause for that. And that mm -hmm. is, you know, probably 95 to 99% of Alzheimer's disease. So we're still talking roughly 80% of all dementia. Okay. Then there are some specific nutrients that, that we can really focus on. Um, the, the first are, are B vitamins. Um, there are some very nice studies looking at homocysteine levels. So homocysteine is, is a marker of overall B vitamin and methylation status. Um, and those who have elevated homocysteine, which is actually quite common, uh, although that's uh, come down a little bit after we started to fortify foods with B vitamins like folic acid. Mm -hmm. um, high homocysteine is associated with increased risk of dementia, as well as uh, cardiovascular disease and a whole bunch of other things. And if we supplement with B vitamins and bring our homocysteine down, then we can uh, decrease the risk uh, or the rate of cognitive decline, decrease the rate of brain atrophy, which is basically your brain shrinking. Um, as you as you head into cognitive decline and dementia the other side of that um, is omega-3 status so there are now several randomized controlled trials that say that you can't just have one or the other you have to have both so you have to have low homocysteine and you have to have adequate omega-3s um, primarily going to come from fatty fish or and or fish oil um, and one of the problems that we've had in the nutrition arena with cognitive decline and actually in general is that we treat it like it's a single variable problem, right? I'll take everybody and I'll give them omega-3s and then mm -hmm. I'll say, well, omega-3s don't work because we didn't decrease dementia, but that's because you didn't look at homocysteine and maybe some other things and all, the, all these factors interact. But those are probably the the the, the most important things. Um, and then from there, there's, there's obviously a whole host of other um, nutrients that are interesting in terms of cognitive function and cognitive decline polyphenols from things like berries and coffee uh seem to be protective again there's randomized controlled trials um choline uh which you primarily get from eggs and liver also very important um magnesium uh potentially very important but you'll tend to get more of these things as long as you just focus on a uh, mm -hmm. a less processed diet and it's these nutrients that tend to get removed when we do these the 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 sort of ultra processing of these modern industrialized foods. Um, and then the other side is that if we eat more of those ultra processed foods, we have a, a higher risk of dementia. There's a number of reasons why that might be. It might be because um, you have larger blood sugar spikes uh, and or um, other, um, and we haven't talked about blood sugar control, no. but that's an important part of, of nutrition. Um, how, does, how does the blood sugar spike uh, sort of damage the brain? That's a tricky question to answer, right. and we're not sure yet that one spike in blood sugar really does damage the brain. It's okay. probably a compounding effect of multiple things. So 
larger blood sugar swings tend to uh, result in uh, more being more likely to be hungry later, being less satiated, and so then you're more likely to overconsume foods. Mm -hmm. um, foods um, that are in that category tend to be low in protein. Uh, that also um, results in larger uh, blood uh, larger blood sugar spikes or larger blood sugar swings. Um, and we have a there's this uh, idea of the protein leverage hypothesis we call it, which basically says that you have an amount of protein you need to eat every day, and if you don't uh, get enough, you'll just keep eating. You'll keep being hungry until you've consumed uh, enough protein. Mm -hmm. So that's that's another uh, a problem with those. Uh, the the thing that we do know about blood sugar control and dementia is that the higher our fasting blood sugar and the higher our HbA1c, which is a marker of long-term blood sugar control, the higher our risk of uh, mild cognitive impairment, which is sort of the, the pre-Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. uh, change in cognitive function, and then Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So as we go into, say, pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes, our blood sugar control worsens. And that's related to a whole host of factors like sleep and physical activity mm -hmm. and nutrient quality, you know, all the things we're going to talk about. Um, then we know our, our risk uh, increases. Um, okay. So there's there's several potential reasons why ultra processed foods might be associated with with worse overall cognitive function and increased risk of dementia. All right. So someone listening to this, we've got sort of two bits of advice for them. We can say, okay, if you if you haven't got any cognitive impairment, we recommend eating these non processed foods and avoiding processed foods. And if you have got some symptoms, some mild symptoms of cognitive impairment, do they double down on those supplements that you mentioned, the omega threes? Um, B vitamins, folate, choline. I would, in general, if possible, I would recommend testing. Yeah, you can test your HbA1c, you can test your homocysteine level, you can test your omega three level. Um, it's fairly easy to get hold of nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, the GP will do most of those if you ask nicely. Um, so I would test uh, and then figure out where you stand. Yeah. Yeah. That's and the you, that's the that's the best approach. You were involved with a company that did the testing. I believe, or are you still involved with them? Yeah, I work with uh, a company that does some at-home testing called Thriver. Um, but equally, if you can get it for free through your GP, mm. I would recommend you do that. Yeah. Um, uh, so any way that you can access those tests. And then, so say if your home assistant is elevated, the sort of best evidence suggests that you would supplement with uh, B12, uh, B9, which is folate, um, B6, and then potentially riboflavin as well, which is B2. Um, and you probably only need at or around um, the, the sort of the recommended daily allowance, maybe a bit mm -hmm. more than that. So not huge doses. Um, then retest a, a few months later. If you haven't come down, maybe increase the dose. Um, that, 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 that's the best approach. Yeah. Yeah, I did actually did the inside tracker. They do 46 um, biomarkers in the US. And uh, I was surprised to find out I was low in magnesium even though I was supplementing with magnesium. But, uh, you know, typically when you get the supplements, they say, take three a day. I was like, well, I don't want to do that. I'll just take one. And it turns out I was about 60% down on what I should be. So if I took the other two tablets every day, maybe, maybe it would have been better. But I, I've subsequently changed, retested, and it's all back to, back to normal. Magnesium is, is, is tricky to test. Um, red blood cell magnesium is, is, is okay. Yeah. Or you can get total, mag uh, total magnesium. That, that's all right. I, I did both. In, in general, I would recommend a few hundred milligrams a day for most people. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're taking one tablet and it's, it's 100 milligrams, it might not make that much difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, a higher dose for most people seems to do the trick. Mm -hmm. And I've seen you um, on a podcast with uh, Paul Saladino, the Carnivore MD, and Rich Roll, a um, plant-based athlete and podcaster. And I thought it was really nice the way there's actually a lot of common ground between mm. like a carnivore diet versus a um, plant-based diet. But interesting, when you're talking about some B vitamins, the omegas, the cholines, they seem to come from, from animal products. Yeah. Um, and I think that the smartest people I know in the, the plant-based world, of which there are many, mm -hmm. um, and I believe they're doing good work. They would recommend either testing or supplementing with some of those key nutrients that you might mm. uh, be less likely to get on a plant-based diet, particularly B12. 
Mm -hmm. um, but some of those other things maybe, you know, because you're probably going to get, if you're eating lots of greens, you'll probably get plenty of folate. Um, but similarly, you know, on, on any diet, it's possible to not be getting enough of what you need. And yeah. then, you know, testing and supplementing appropriately, I think is perfectly, perfectly reasonable. Um, other things we haven't talked about, vitamin D, iron level, uh, both of those very important for for dementia risk. And if you have low iron or you're anemic uh, or you have low vitamin D, those are both also associated with increased risk of dementia. Mm -hmm. And those are easy to supplement with. Yeah, to, easy to yeah. supplement with and easy to test. Uh, most doctors will, uh, will, will test those. And they all help methylation. Is that correct? Yeah. Most of them do. Uh, choline and the B, uh, most of the B vitamins mm -hmm. I mentioned do. Uh, creatine is another favorite supplement of mine mm. that is also involved in in methylation and it really does seem that methylation is is a critical component of of long term uh long term dementia risk can you just explain what methylation is to the layperson yeah it's essentially um well so a, a methyl group is one carbon with three hydrogens attached that's it's most like the most simple most simple explanation but what it is is it's just a tag that gets kind of moved around and it does a whole bunch of things so mm -hmm. um it's added to molecules as part of biochemical cycles it's added to dna as part of epigenetic regulation which basically says you know turning genes on and off so it's essentially just this simple tag that the body uses uh, uses to say you know we'll now use this molecule for this thing or we'll now turn this gene on or off um, and if we have issues with methylation, so either recycling some of those groups or being able to attach or detach those groups as we want, you know, then we, you know, we, we can't manage our metabolism or gene expression in the way that we'd like. Um, and one sort of catch all output from that system is homocysteine. So if you're not able to uh, run your methylation system as you might like, then homocysteine tends to go up. So that's why it's, so it, it doesn't tell you where the issue is necessarily, mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of a good catch-all marker to say, you know, this is something that, you know, maybe I should think about. And nu nu nutrition and or supplementation is, is usually the first place to start. You work for, you're, you're a consultant for a company called Hinsa. And Hinsa uh, help train people like myself to become Hinsa performance coaches, which help people use aspects of lifestyle medicine um, to increase their performance. And as part of that, you give us some lectures. And one of the lectures you gave us mentioned about how blood sugar can actually be affected by the person's belief in what they're eating. I thought that was fascinating. Can you just, can you tell us a little bit about that study? Yeah, it, it's become very sexy uh, recently to track your blood sugar all the time, mm -hmm. uh, continuous glucose monitoring. Um, and you get these patches, um, depending on where you're based you, you know there are apps that can do it um and or doing it as part of research has become quite a big thing and, and i believe that it's you know managing blood sugar regu regulation is important we've already mentioned one of the reasons why that's the case mm. however there are a whole bunch of things that affect that and there have been some recent studies that suggest that if you take the same person and you feed them the same meal a week apart or two weeks apart, they will have completely different responses in terms right. of blood sugar to that same meal. So it's incredibly variable from person to person. And we don't always know, or and at, within the same person to the same meal over time. And that's related to how you've slept, what time of day it is, whether you've exercised before or after. So just, it right now, it's this really complex mm -hmm. um, sort of moving target that, that I think is probably too much for, for most people to, to worry about. And one of the one of the other reasons that I think that most people don't need to focus on this is because there is a there becomes a stress in a lot of people associated with tracking this. And I've seen this in some of the clients that I've worked with. They like they become that they see a spike in blood sugar, which like I mentioned earlier, like one spike, depending on the size and the frequency, probably not a big deal. But we we're kind of becoming conditioned to think that blood sugar going up is all of a sudden a bad thing and they get stressed about it and that probably makes the sugar spike go up even higher because as you get stressed you release adrenaline you release cortisol both of those things drive your blood sugar up so the stress itself you know as well as you know because yeah. of other things is probably worse than the blood sugar spike exactly. um and so then this brings me on to the study you're asking about where um they gave di these are diabetics so they're already very 
conscious about their blood sugar and they gave diabetics two different milkshakes one was a high sugar milkshake and one was a low sugar milkshake um and they looked at their blood sugar responses over time and they they showed them the nutrition label um you know this is what you're about to drink this is how much sugar sugar's in it and these people have to have some idea of how that's going to affect their blood sugar because you have to track your blood sugar when you're mm. diabetic and as you would expect the high blood sugar milkshake caused the bigger spike in blood sugar the twist is that it was the same milkshake both times um so the expectation and maybe even a bit of stress because you know if you're managing your blood sugar then anything that's going to increase your blood sugar you have to think about do i have to dose my insulin or do something else you know all that is sugar uh, bad for my diabetes you know all those things come into play there's so it's probably partly driven by a stress response you can that manipulated blood sugar more so actually than the milkshake uh, itself so there's a number of reasons why yes blood sugar is important but i think we've gotten to the point where we're over focused on it and right. it started to become a stressor for some people which i would argue is probably a net negative yeah how interesting i think like i had the, the whoop wristband for for the year and yeah. uh it was a stressor um after a while when yeah. i wasn't getting the green recoveries i was like wondering, wondering what's going on you know and that obviously led to less green recoveries and yeah yeah maybe i had the, the, I, I had the same experience with yeah. with uh with an aura ring right. uh, a while back uh i think it's worth saying that i think some, these data can be really helpful yeah. but the ideal scenario is that i collect my data and i never see it yeah but say my coach or somebody yeah. else sees it and helps me integrate it over time. Mm -hmm. Like that I think is the perfect scenario rather than, you know, like you sleep terribly. And the first thing you do is you open up your whoop app and see, Oh, I slept terribly last night. Yeah. Um, so actually the, the same, now there's another study re related to that. It was the same group uh, at Harvard that did the, the milkshake study. Mm -hmm. In this study, what they did is they took people and they had them sleep in a lab. And they had them either sleep for five hours or eight hours. But what this group likes to focus on is the manipulation of clock time. So they randomized half the people to be told the opposite of what they actually slept. So some people slept five hours and were told they slept eight hours. And some people uh, slept eight hours and were told they slept five. Um, and what they saw was that the amount of sleep you thought you got was... Uh, a better predictor of your cognitive function and and, and uh, like how sleepy you felt the next day than the amount of sleep you actually got. So I can just imagine, right, you open your app and it's like, hey, you slept terribly last night. And then that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You think, well, I'm going to just, my, my brain's not going to work. I'm going to be tired. And it's all because of your expectation rather than necessarily because of how you actually slept. And so Again, I think these data are interesting, but we just have to think about how it affects our psychology and our physio and our psychology affects our physiology as well. Exactly. It's a two way street, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, we need to if we're going to get through all six, we need to move on. I don't know if we're going <laughs> to make it. All right. So physical activity. Uh, everyone knows they need to do something aerobic, some strength work, maybe. What's the research saying that we should be doing? Let's say someone's 40 years old and up. What, what's the research saying they should do to stave off um, or cause mortality or dementia? Basically, the the fitter and stronger you can be, the better. Uh, uh, and there's vast amounts of, of research that support that. Um, when you look at how much is enough, there have been some nice meta-analyses of, of studies that suggest that basically hitting the standard government guidelines for physical activity, something like 150 minutes a week of moderate to vigorous physical activity, that's the minimum effective dose to significantly improve cognitive function. So achievable by anybody. And it, there's it, it, it's all sort of... Um, there's an, You can just think of an equation in your head. We mm -hmm. don't have to think about an equation. But you just think about, right, the more intense it is, the, the less I need to do, the less intense it is, the more I need to do, right? right. So... If you're going to do some light gardening, maybe you do an hour a day and that's your quota for the day. If you're going to yeah. do some sprinting, five minutes is probably enough. And in terms of how they affect the brain, those things are roughly equivalent. So then you just kind of, you can patch together little bits of movement depending on what it is that you like to do. Interesting. Um, okay. Hmm. 
there were there are some interventional studies um because some of that data is epidemiological it's like asking people how much exercise they do and, and looking at their cognitive function and that's kind of confounded by other things like people who uh come from a higher socio socioeconomic status background are more likely to do exercise so you kind yeah. of have to for various reasons they have more time more resources so you kind of have to account for some of that mm -hmm. but in trials um they've shown that if you do something like a brisk walking intervention seems to be protective of the hippocampus which is a uh, an area of the brain that's um important for memory and and is affected by alzheimer's disease and that was just 40 minutes of brisk walking three times a week, which they did for a year. Um, there was probably slightly more impressively, there's been a couple of studies looking at resistance training. So depending on the study, two to three times of like going to a gym, picking six to eight weights machines, doing three sets of eight to 12 reps, just like super standard um, uh, resistance training approach. That's associated with improvements in uh, structure and function of many areas of the brain as well as cognitive function. So if you're then trying to kind of put, put together a bare bones plan, I would say some kind of aerobic activity two or three times a week, some kind of resistance training activity two or three times a week, 30 to 45 minutes each time. Um, and then the final piece is that in general, the most protective physical activity for the brain is uh that which includes some kind of coordination mm -hmm. so um nice evidence of things like yoga tai chi and it's probably because that coordinative component provides an extra stimulus to the brain and i think one of the most important if not the most important thing for maintaining cognitive function long term is to keep stimulating your brain by doing new and challenging things mm -hmm. um so those kinds of activities are really important so you could have extra sessions, right? Where on top of everything else, you do some yoga as well. Um, but yoga adds some muscle strengthening. And uh, you, your aerobic activity session could be badminton rather mm -hmm. than going for a run. And then you have that coordination component that, that that's important. So it's not that you need to do separate sessions for all those things. You can often tick multiple boxes at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. Like dancing gives you physical activity. It gives you social connection. We haven't talked about that, but that's important. Yeah. And it gives you coordination. Uh, so it, it gives you a whole bunch of things. And there are some studies that suggest, you know, if you're looking at the structure of the brain and you make people do either dancing or some kind of unimodal circuit mm -hmm. training or something, the dancing is better, probably because you're doing all those different things at the same time. So you can tick multiple boxes within single activities if you're crunched for time. Yeah. I remember you saying about how, you know, even if someone loses their hearing, it's a decreased uh, cognitive activity because they're not getting that stimulus and that can help. Yeah. The, that makes the brain atrophy slightly. So. Yeah. So what, what, while you're saying that, um, th those are very important things in it. It doesn't really, it doesn't quite fit within the, the lifestyle medicine framework, but maintaining those inputs is really important. So if you have cataracts, get cataract surgery. If you have hearing loss, get hearing aids, because we know that those mm -hmm. that can help stave off um, an increased risk of cognitive decline mm. if you start to lose your senses, uh, particularly in those at high risk. Mm. I, I got a, a quick aside. Uh, so I thought I'd just dabble with some psychedelics a couple of years ago, and uh, I took the ay ayahuasca, which is um, South American plant and, um, and vine, and it, and it can give you a, a hallucinogenic experience. And during it, you you sort of get into a dialogue with whatever the voice is and and it was saying to me okay so you're an osteopath you use your hands to help people yeah, he goes, well you know how does that work you're not changing the this is it's in, saying you're not changing the ligaments under your fingers i'm like no it doesn't work like that i think it's probably a, a pressure input that goes up the nerves to the brain and somehow the brain modulates the, the reflex mm -hmm. and the ayahuasca says okay so how does hearing work i'm like well sound wave goes in turns into electrical impulse in the brain Goes, yeah, how does smell work? How does taste work? How does it's the same thing? It goes in, it's an electrical impulse, turns around, comes out as a reflex. And so I was like, okay, yeah, we're on the same page. And the ayahuasca says, so why are you limiting yourself to just a physical input? That's not going to help people as well as if you do all the senses. And I was like, oh, geez. And then I, then I said, how do I do that? And the ayahuasca said, you got to dance with your clients. That's what it was saying. And, and it's. There you go. Is there it is. I mean, if you yeah. get the, the music and maybe there's a smell or a color, you've got all the stimulus. It's it's a very human thing. 
mm. to dance, right? And 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 I think when you boil down these important inputs to the brain, the the ones that are the most protective are these sort of like core human traits, like mm -hmm. language, music, dancing. Um, and I think that's something that we've we've sort of lost. But now, you know, in the in the era of evidence based medicine, we're now starting. You know, even though intuitively we could think, well, yeah, that yeah. makes sense that that would be important. Now we're starting to see some some good evidence to then support that as well. Yeah, I think so. I think that's the, the, the medical model, right? We have to dissect it, reduce it down to its components and then build it back up until we're happy that what we may have known intuitively before, well, now we can prove it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to sleep and recovery. Um, is sleep as important as we think it is? Yes. Okay, tell me more. <laughs> um, there are... A couple of different aspects to that. Uh, if we try and think about putting together this model of how the brain works so that we can maintain its health long term, uh, we kind of mentioned that these critical stimulating inputs probably regulate a whole bunch of um, you know, the main processes mm -hmm. in terms of maintaining brain function. But when you stimulate an area of the brain, it then needs to recover. Um, it undergoes plasticity. You know, maintaining developing connections, maybe um, bringing in new cells, uh, uh, making new cells, you know, either bringing in or making new cells. Um, and that critical period of adaptation happens during sleep. And there are some nice studies that suggest that if you particularly stimulate one area of the brain, that area of the brain then sleeps more or sleeps differently afterwards because it is then actively recovering from that process. So we have to provide that period for the brain to uh, adapt and recover. Um, <clears throat> there are lots of epidemiological studies that say that if you're regularly sleeping less than six to seven hours a night, that's associated with an increased risk of dementia. Um, low or poor sleep quality is probably also as important as quantity, but um, you know, quantity is easier to to measure and tra change, you know, give yourself yeah. enough time in bed, give yourself enough sleep opportunity. But people who are regularly resorting to, you know, medications to help themselves sleep or they report waking up several times during the night, that seems to be associated with a high risk of dementia as well. Uh, one common risk factor for that is sleep apnea, um, you know, which is, again, associated with um, particularly uh, obesity, um, or other body composition changes that then you know make it harder to keep your airway open as mm -hmm. you sleep. So that's something that sh sh people should just keep an eye on. Um, if you are doing blood tests and your hemoglobin, which is a measure of your red blood cells, is going up, that is often um, a, a sign of sleep apnea because what happens is you get hypoxic at night. Your body wow. tries, because you're hypoxic, your body tries to make more red blood cells to deliver more oxygen. And that causes your hemoglobin to go up. So it's very common. We'll see, particularly in older men, if the hemoglobin starts to go up, um, it's because they have sleep apnea. I think there are other reasons why sleep is really important. Um, sort of short-term sleep is associated with cognitive function, a whole range of them, reaction time. We know that uh, cognitive function decreases you know, pretty rapidly, uh, certainly with complete sleep deprivation, but also you know, chronic sleep loss. Um, and then other important aspects like people who are sleep deprived, they are less empathetic. They are more likely to respond negatively to others. Uh, you sort of get this, uh, the the amygdala becomes overactivated. That's the area of the brain that's sort of that uh, fight, flight or fright kind of uh, kind of response. And you're more likely to, to have a, a negative response to, to something, you know, normally you just like let it wash over you. But if you're sleep deprived, the amygdala lights up and then you're more likely to, to, to get angry or wind, wound up or have a negative uh, response or interaction. So short term and long term sleep seems to be really critical for, for cognitive function and then dementia risk. And I think you shared a study with us on sleep masks as well, saying that simply putting a sleep mask can change things. Yeah, there was a nice study um, done over in the UK, and they had two um, they had two cohorts of students. They looked at them particularly in the summer, where um, light, you know, the, the sun is either going to wake up, is, is either going to rise really early in the morning, or it's going to be, you know, not set yet when they go to bed. So the, the sun is going to be potentially affecting sleep. And then they had a, 
and wear either like a Zorro mask where sort of they have the feeling of wearing a mask, but the eye holes are cut out so the sunlight can still get into the eyes <laughs> or a or or a sleep mask that sort of completely covered their eyes. And they found that those who slept with a sleep mask had particularly better um, improved um, reaction time the next day. So psychomotor vigilance is the fancy uh, term for that. Um, and I think they also they also had some improvements in in memory uh, retention. So, you know, if you are unable to keep your bedroom completely dark, you know, alarm clocks, lights and other things, uh, street lamps outside, then a sleep mask is a really easy way to get around that. And I sleep with a sleep mask every night. It's just like, just become yeah. a thing that I do. Me too. And I have earplugs and a sleep mask as well. Sure. I, I like, I prefer white noise to uh, earplugs, but. Yeah. or some kind some kind of either a fan or yeah. air conditioning or something like that well i live in nicaragua so i've I've got the fans but they're so loud because it's so hot here and i don't yeah. i don't like sleeping with ac so i've got i got a bit of everything yeah okay okay let's move on um there's what are called avoiding toxic substances one of the tenants but i think we can come back to that one because it's a bit more obvious for most people but mm. i wanted to get into community because Lifestyle medicine, it talks about, you know, sleep and nutrition and so on. And everyone's like on board with that. But then community is, is a harder one for people to actually realize that it can affect their health and their longevity. What are the studies showing around um, community and how can people help that? There are, again, some quite large meta-analyses, so studies of, of many studies looking at social support and social connection and, and risk of dementia. And essentially, the risk goes in both directions. So if you're well supported, you feel like, you know, you have good social support. And there are ways they measure that, like your subjective feeling of social support. So how how uh, supported do you feel? You know, in a time of crisis, do you have somebody who you can talk to? Um, mm -hmm. You know, do you have a, a partner that you live with? Those kinds of things. Um, that's associated with a decreased dementia risk. Whereas the opposite is also true. If you feel socially, socially isolated, you don't have um, that kind of social network or it's a poor quality social network, then you have an increased risk of dementia. And I think there's just a whole range of reasons why this is probably the case. So mm -hmm. interacting with other humans is is one of those critical inputs that, that the brain relies on um, uh, in, in terms of overall cognitive function, right, that we, that we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just not the same if you're just like, you know, watching TV or something else, you need that, that two way, that two way interaction. And similarly, like often people will say, well, I've retired, so I'm going to start doing some crosswords and Sudoku and that's going to stimulate my brain. And they, those things seem to be more of like a meditative stress reduction practice. So it's not that they're not good for the brain. Like that can be beneficial in terms of, you know, reducing stress and having sort of like more more kind of like mindfulness but it's not directly stimulating the brain mm -hmm. as it would be if you're having a conversation um like we are so that's one part but then there are these um pretty well defined now uh responses to good social support and lack of social stress or the opposite being that if we are socially stressed uh particularly if we feel isolated it has direct effects on our physiology. So it activates stress responses, it activates inflammatory responses. And this is this evolutionary aspect of survival. So if you're alone, you your body needs to respond to different threats than if you're living around and supported by other people. There are threats in both. Like if you're living in a community, you're more likely to get viral infections, you know, colds, things like that that are passed along. But if you're out isolated and alone in the wilderness you're more likely to die from uh like a bacterial infection or a cut or, or something like that so your immune system shifts accordingly in the long term that shift associated with isolation is sort of a, a provides this chronic pro-inflammatory status mm -hmm. um and is associated with a whole host of um sort of cardiovascular and other chronic diseases so i just did a a whole special issue of the Lifestyle Medicine Journal that I help uh, to edit uh, with my friend, Dr. Julian Abel, who's a, um, he's a palliative care doctor in the UK and an expert in the effects of community and social connection on health. Okay. And we essentially got all the experts in the world on this field to write papers and they're part of the special issue. But there's one in particular written by George Slavich, who's at UCLA, 
um, that looks at how does social isolation and social stress affect your physiology? How does it affect your gene expression? How does it affect you know inflammation? It's, it's a really cool paper. So you can kind of look okay. at these direct effects on our, our physiology from you know being socially isolated or not having that kind of um, human connection. And then this translates to long-term chronic disease risk. So elevated inflammation, systemically elevated um, cortisol, other stress hormones. We know those things are uh, associated with high risk of dementia in particular, because that's what we're talking about, as well as, you know, you've lost those critical connection mm -hmm. inputs from mm -hmm. interacting with other people. And in your day job, you're helping uh, neonates and, and infants rebuild brains. Mm -hmm. And the sort of act of growing up and going through those developmental stages is a huge input to a brain. Yeah. And when we tell older people who may be thinking about retiring to keep stimulus and uh, you know, keep their brain stimulated, and we say do a crossword or or do a puzzle, these two things aren't on the same level, are they? As we're learning how to walk versus crosswords. No, I, I, absolutely not. And the that's kind of informed how I think about the brain, because if if you think about the things that are required to build a healthy brain or say repair an injured brain early on we know that a uh, supportive environment um, and there's various ways to measure that but it's generally related to um, education and other inputs um, has has a huge effect on recovery as well as the initial development of mm -hmm. the brain and when you then look across uh, cognitive function across the entire life what what happens is that cognitive function essentially peaks around the time that formal education ends so you have spent the first depending on who you are 12 14 24 30 in my case I was, case. Yeah, yeah, I, was case. Yeah, yeah. I was a perennial student <laughs> um you, you spend this period of time where basically you are a full-time learner you know first you're learning to walk and talk and social interaction you know and then you're learning some maths and then you're learning some biochemistry and at some point maybe you're learning to drive but it's just this concerted period of you know one to three decades where all you're doing is stimulating your brain essentially mm -hmm. that, that's, your, that's your job you know in most in most situations uh, though not everybody gets that um, situation or those uh, sort of benefits privileges and then at that point once formal education stops then your cognitive function just decreases over time uh, on average. Um, and we put that down to aging, right? My brain's just getting older. It doesn't work as well. I would argue that it's flipped. It's that we use, we stimulate our brain less. We teach it fewer new things. We do fewer challenging things, which we love to do as kids, right? Because we want those inputs. It's almost like in our genes to go out and experience the world and get those inputs. Whereas when you're an adult, you go to work, you do the same thing again and again and again. You specialize more and more and more um, in general. Um, you feel busy because you've got emails and files to put out and everything every day, but it's just not the same. So I would argue that one of the primary drivers of cognitive decline is the fact that we stop using our brains in that way. So um, when you then retire there is some evidence to suggest that that's the period of, of fastest cognitive decline is right after retirement because you do get some stimulus from your work and then you remove it um and then if all you do is a little bit of sudoku it's just not enough to to, to make up for it and mm -hmm. uh my colleague uh, dr josh turkin and i wrote, wrote a paper about this that came out last year and we've got lots more papers coming out on it because we're quite passionate about this idea well, this was shown with the amateur versus professional musicians. Uh, yes, there was there was a study on that. Can you tell us about that one? Sure. So there's a there's a an, a machine learning algorithm that they they uh, put, use on MRI scans, and it's now been used in I think hundreds of studies. It's called Brain Age, and you sort of you train up this algorithm with with thousands of MRI scans, and then you take a new MRI scan and you say, how old does this brain look? Right, compare, you know, if you've looked at all these brains, you've trained it on brains across a whole range of ages. And in this study, what they found was that musicians of the same age as controls, um, you know, normal people, had younger looking brains. 
I think they, uh, in general, this group was sort of in their thirties. Mm -hmm. Um, but amateur musicians had even younger looking brains than professional musicians. And the hypothesis posed by the authors is that learning a musical instrument is hard. It's a, this critical additional input that the, the control group weren't getting, but for an amateur, it's even harder, right? Once you're a professional, it's sort of, it's all happening by, uh, you know, a lot of its reflexes. It's mm -hmm. just habit. It's just happening. Whereas when you're an amateur, you have to work much harder to to get a good um a good good performance, say. And that was associated with an even greater benefit. Um and there are similar studies um around language. So people who grow up bilingual seem to have uh, protection of some areas of the brain associated with lower risk of dementia. Um so all of these critical inputs can can provide this resilience and improved function throughout life. So the, the take home here then is to say, well, if you're getting towards the end of your career, don't just sit and watch Netflix. We, you got to take on a hobby that's mentally yes. challenging to keep the the cortex kind of stimulated. Absolutely. And then when you get good at that, do yeah. something else Move on. that you're yeah. bad at. So it's, I mean, it's nice to be good at things and, and often we can do that in a social situation and go and meet other people, right? That, that can build our community mm -hmm. that can manage our stress that provides, you know, these sort of challenging inputs to the brain. So keep doing things that you're good at. That's also important because it's enjoyable, but always, you know, occasionally do things that you're bad at um, because that's this novel stimulus to the brain that I, I think is, is really critical. Okay. All right, so I don't think we've got quite got enough time to get into stress management because that's a huge topic. And the toxic substances, you know, I think people know not to smoke and, and drink too much alcohol. But yeah. there was something that when I was researching this for this podcast, concussions came up. And I was like, mm. okay, this is an interesting one because this isn't an, a toxic substance. It's not, it doesn't fit anywhere else, but it's a could be a sporting thing as a youngster. And in yeah. there, you you've talked about creatine as being slightly protective of a brain that may come under stress of a concussion. And you mentioned creatine in the, in the nutrition. Is mm. If I've got that right, is it protective or is it something that just changes with, with people who have concussions? Yeah, that's um, that's an interesting question. And, and you're right, it, that, that sort of injury to the brain is its, is its whole separate um, right. factor. But yeah. you, can, you can almost build it into the same model because when you injure the brain, you probably trigger some kind of um, inflammatory response. And and one thing that we see with the brain is that if you injure it, you have you can have inflammation in the brain for decades. Right? They just it just keeps on going. There's these immune cells in the brain called microglia that just get angry and they stay angry. And when they do that, that can eventually cause dam damage in its own right. Um, so there's things like that that and then when you're doing that, you are preventing this ability to adapt and respond to inputs. So it, it, you can kind of fit it into the same model. Okay. Um, as well as, you know, it affects, you know, how well the neurons use their energy and all these other kinds of things. Creatine, I think is important. Um, the, so uh, there are a couple of studies where they looked at creatine in people's brains and you can measure it on a certain type of MRI scan called a magnet, magnetic resonance spectroscopy scan or MRS, MRS scan. You can look at things like choline and creatine in the brain. And they looked at high school American football players and over the course of the season, the more collisions they were involved in, the greater the decrease in creatine and choline in certain areas of the brain. Mm -hmm. um, and nobody has has really used then creatine supplementation to say well this decreases your risk of concussions or or um you know the negative effects of concussions long term um but we do know that in animal studies if you uh pre you you give them a similar amount of creatine as you might take a, as an athlete and then you expose them to a traumatic brain injury that creatine is is protective so there's kind of two parts of it. One, we know that concussions maybe decrease mm -hmm. or impacts of the brain decrease creatine. Decreasing creatine may be part of what they call second impact syndrome, which is when you have one hit, it doesn't have that much of an effect. But when you get the second hit, it has an outsized effect. You're like, well, that wasn't really that bad of an impact. Yeah. But all of a sudden, this person has much worse symptoms. And it may be because you've sort of depleted some of these protected factors in the brain. And then you hit the, and then the brain gets um, injured again. So 
I think there are a few things that are potentially beneficial here. So creatine is one, choline is another, and choline has been used in some randomized controlled trials after traumatic brain injury and has been shown to improve particularly neuropsychological outcomes. So there's randomized controlled evidence for it. Um, Omega-3s, there was a study, again, with American football, where they supplemented with DHA across a season, and there was less of an accumulation of uh, a marker of a neuronal injury in the blood over time. So again, uh, omega-3s, fish uh, can, can mm -hmm. be really important. Um, so some of these basic um, nutrients that, that, we, that, we, that we mentioned earlier, it's the same things yeah. that are important uh, in, in both settings. And as I understand it as well, if, if you have a concussion, you know, that's going to help on, on the building of the brain, but then it's avoiding some things as well, like uh, fatty foods, bright lights, too much computer work, um, and, and so on, in the acute phase anyway. Yeah, um, so, some things. So if, if somebody is recovering from a, from a concussion, some other things that are important are early return to physical activity, um, but up to a threshold that doesn't make your symptoms worse. So the sooner you can get moving again, do some light aerobic activity, that seems to be protective. Most of those studies come from the sort of pediatric or teenage population mm -hmm. rather than adults. But um, it seems it we kind of think it's going to be the same in adults. Uh, but as long as you're not exercising enough to make your symptoms worse, um, blood sugar control is probably going to be really important. Um, so again, and there are lots of animal studies that show if you increase blood sugar around the type of the, the time of a, a traumatic brain injury or afterwards you have you can have a, a greater injury um and temperature is another one that i'm uh sort of that i often get on my soapbox about because i did my phd on temperature after brain right. injury um so basically preventing a fever after a concussion is really important because if you get a fever uh, after a concussion that can worsen the the brain injury because you essentially increase a, a, an energetic deficit in the brain when you increase temperature your metabolic rate goes up but you've created an injury that de decreases your ability to generate energy in the brain. And so you kind of increase the gap there and that can make the energy, uh, that can make the the injury worse. So, you know, avoiding getting too hot um, and or taking things to to decrease a fever like paracetamol or something like that, um, really important, particularly early on, the first sort of two or three days after a concussion. Perfect. Okay, Tommy, thank you so much for dropping some knowledge bombs on us here. I know that you're a busy man and you've got to, to get on. But um, where can people find out more about you if they listen to this podcast? They're like, oh, he's an interesting guy. Um, yeah, the, the, the best place is usually Instagram, um, at Dr. Tommy Wood on Instagram. Um, if you go there or to my website, uh, which is drtommywood.com, um, you can find my podcast called mm -hmm. The Better Brain Fitness Podcast, which I do with Josh Turknet, who I mentioned earlier. Um, and it's a QA and a format. So you can go to the web, uh, the podcast website. You can either record a question or you can type in a question. Um, and we answer questions that we think uh, you know, sort of people, the, the general listenership mm -hmm. will be interested in. Um, and then we, we also do some other things. Like sometimes we do a little journal club and talk about recent papers. And sometimes we have guests. But in general, if you have a question about any of the stuff that I talked about today, check out the podcast and or ask us a question and we'll try and get to it. Great. Thanks for being on the show, Tommy. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for joining me in my conversation with Tommy Wood. If you're enjoying listening to and learning from this podcast, please leave me a comment and you can leave a suggestion for a future podcast guest that you would like us to feature. In addition, on Apple, you can leave us a comment and up to a five-star review. Now, in case you didn't know, I actually help people using the tenets of lifestyle medicine to recover from illness and injury. And if you want my direct help, you can send me an email, ed at edpaget.com or visit my website, edpaget.com. Once there, you can also sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is packed full of great advice about using lifestyle medicine to add health span to your lifespan. <laughs>